I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Reducing Oracle Costs. My name is Arlene Ettore and I'm a webinar coordinator for the Outsourcing Institute. And it is our pleasure to be the co-host of today's event with Axiom. I'll be working in the background to help answer any technical or general questions that you may have. But before we begin, I'd like to quickly tell you about a few tools that you'll be able to use throughout today's session. First, we encourage you at any time during the presentation to submit your questions to today's speakers. To do this, click on the questions box, type your question in the space provided, and click on the submit button. During today's presentation, we'll be asking poll questions to get to know you better and to help ensure that the content is relevant to your specific needs. When the poll appears, be sure to select the answer that best fits each question. Today's webinar is being recorded. You will be receiving a follow-up email in approximately two days, which will include a link with today's recorded webinar and presentation slides. The webinar recording and the presentation slides will also be available at Outsourcing.com. So without further ado, I will now turn it over to Jeffrey Shoup, Mainframe Product Leader for Axiom. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jeff and I'm looking forward to having uh, this time with everybody that's joined us on this call. I want to get started by introducing myself. I lead our mainframe practice in our system Z, which also includes Linux on Z. And alongside of me here is Paul Augustiniak, and I'll let Paul introduce himself. Thanks, Chef. My name is Paul Augustiniak, and my title with IBM is Linux on System Z New Workload Leader for the North American IoT. And it's a, it's a big way of saying what, what I end up doing is talking with customers about how they can take their workload specifically from distributed servers and consolidate it onto Linux on System Z. And these workloads take a lot of different forms. So what we're going to talk about today is really focus in on the Oracle-based workload and how customers have done Oracle consolidation to Linux on System Z. Again, Good day to everybody, and uh, we're glad to have you here with us at the webinar. Now, before we kick off, I want to get an idea of where your heads are at out there. So we're going to pop up a poll question, and I'm going to have Arlene give us an idea of, or have you give you an idea of uh, what, uh, you know, what your server farm looks like now currently. So uh, you'll see the poll question pop up. Go ahead and pick one of those choices, and then let's give it a minute or so, and then we'll come back and find out what the answers look like. All right, Arlene, I don't know if we've uh, we finished it up, but uh, let's go ahead and display the answers. We actually have a shy audience today, Paul. Um, uh, we haven't had anyone to vote yet, so um, a few of you would like to go ahead and vote, that would be great. Okay, don't, don't be shy. Go ahead, and, uh, go ahead and pop your answers in there, and uh, we'll give it another 10 seconds or so. Okay, I think, Paul, well, we'll just move on. All right, let's carry on. Let's carry on then. Uh, you know, we, I talked a second ago about, uh, about consolidation and, and what folks do in consolidation. And, you know, there's a lot of ways that people think about in terms of what they do when they want to consolidate. And one of the components is, boy, you know, our servers are, are starting to age. They're starting to get a little bit long in tooth. And you know, why don't we consolidate now and take advantage of doing that? And, I'm going to, again, specifically focus on Oracle as we move on here, but we had an idea of the cost of an aging server. Uh, we, we talked with our, our friends from, from Forrester, one of the leading analyst groups out there, and, and asked that what, do, what are those downtime components of what happens when your servers age and, and what happens when failures start to become bigger? Well, the point that they brought up are here on the screen right now. So I'll, uh, I'll quickly walk through them and we can get an idea of what they mean. But revenue losses, again, you know, how much revenue do you lose when downtime occurs? Now, you could be in a financial services industry where revenue is measured by the second, and we've had folks, folks in the financial services industry tell us that $100,000 or $200,000 a second might not, be, uh, might not be too far off. But 
you know, I, I give it a little bit more of a conservative estimate and say that you know, it could be 100 or 2,000, 100,000 or 200,000 in terms of a minute or in terms of an hour. Impact to cash flow, when you're not able to process transactions, when you're not able to process your information, of course that's going to affect your cash flow. It's going to affect the way that you're able to pay. Productivity losses, I think, just from a grand scheme of now we have people, instead of worrying about how to do their jobs, they're worried about how to bring the server firm back up. From a compliance standpoint, if you think about all the compliance components that are out there these days, uh, the idea that you may be losing time or your servers go down because of compliance or then you can't do your, uh, your regulatory reporting, that's going to cost money. Penalties and losses of discounts, again, being able to process information, being able to process payments. Uh, when that doesn't happen on time and those servers don't work, you're going to be able to, you're going to uh, you're going to put yourself in the position of having to pay a penalty. From a, an impact to customers, if your servers are down or if your environment's down, uh, just think about that. You know, we just passed uh, Cyber Monday here. So just think about the fact that, you know, if your transaction is in process or you get a server error when your customers, you know, attempt to make an order, that's going to give you not only a bad impression to your customer, but you're also going to lose revenue based on that. And that's going to damage your reputation as you move on. So you know, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of penalties, uh, both inherent and, and also not inherent or not uh, visible on what would happen if, you know, your server environment goes down. So as we go to the next slide, you know, let's talk a little bit about some of the things that, that we can do or some of the things that make it, uh, I think, a little bit more you know, important that you think about. You know, we're going to talk about how to consolidate and what we can do to help your business consolidate. And if you look at this picture, you know, we show the fact that there's a lot of single-purpose services out there. I mean, this could be your environment, a lot of single servers out there. Uh, well, what makes it easy for us to be able to do business? Well, part of it is, you know, how can we consolidate you know, those multiplicity of servers with a bunch of single functions you know, into a single Linux enterprise server? Because what we'll talk about during the course of the rest of the discussion today is what a Linux enterprise server is, how it can help you, and then certainly how Axiom can help bring your workloads from maybe your old server farm that's run at Oracle to a server farm here at Axiom. Uh, a lot less to go wrong, a lot fewer moving parts, the ability to standardize. All these are important when you think about consolidation, specifically consolidation for Oracle to a server farm and to folks here at Axon. So let's go to the next slide, Arlene, and take a look and see what we've got. I want to be very specific here and, and focus on Oracle as the, as the webinar states, and I want to show you some of the economics on, on how these kinds of consolidations can take place. And when you look at the chart here, what you're seeing is what licensing costs would be for a total cost of ownership for 30 distributed servers, okay? And you look at that new x86 box, and what you see on that line chart is, you know, the large red part of that bar chart is Oracle. That's software-based licenses. Underneath it, you see OS, which is your operating system, so we're talking specifically here about Linux. Virtual machine software, that could be anything from the IBM System Z or ZVM virtualization software, and on the x86 side, it's going to be something like VMware. Hardware maintenance, what's it cost to keep that hardware up, and then finally the physical hardware. And, and as you look at the chart, I think you'll see something, and you'll see a glaring piece that says, hey, I'm paying a lot for software if I'm on x86, and not so much when we move to System Z. And you'll see those first two boxes, Z10 DC, that's Baker Charlie, with four IFLs, and I'll talk about what an IFL is here in a moment, but you'll see that that was our technology that was one generation ago. Our latest technology, that Z114, is the second generation, and a couple things should become apparent. One is going to be the fact that there are three IFLs, and the cost is less on that Z114 than it is on the, uh, the Z10BC. But the other point, and I think you know, I'd like you to notice, is the fact that that new X86 farm, you pay a whole lot more in Oracle licenses than you do on System Z Linux, and we'll talk further about how that happens as we go to the next slide. We may have Arlene change it to how the math works on this whole thing, and I want you to be a bit patient with me because I'm going to walk through this slide and tell you how we make a calculation that says, hey, how can I save money when I move from a distributed environment, and maybe my servers are aging, to an environment where it's consolidated, where I've got an expert managing it, and where I'm going to pay an Oracle software. Now, we're going to take this example with the consideration that you as a customer are paying for your Oracle licenses. 
So let's consider again, again on the top here. It says consider an existing server, and I just pick one out of the uh, out of the vast amount of servers that are out there. And it's a uh, a Sun Spark V490. Back to my initial question on aging servers. I mean, this is not certainly the latest and greatest technology, but this server has four chips and four cores. So let's say that your shop has got 10 of these systems. That second line says I've got 10 servers, I've got 40 chips, and I've got 80 cores. That's the way that the math starts to roll down. Now let's say that again that these systems are running Oracle Enterprise 10G or they're running 11G, and the yearly maintenance is going to be paid by the core. So that means you're going to pay maintenance on 80 of those cores. So as you see, $10,450 is right as the Oracle price list states. That's what you're going to pay per core for maintenance on that Oracle, on those Oracle licenses. The next line talks about this core, this notion of a core factor, and it's a pricing methodology that Oracle uses based on the technology that customer might be using. The core factor for this particular server, that V490, is 0.75. So when you do the math, you have 80 cores times port 0.75, and now you're actually counting 60 cores and the maintenance you're going to pay on those 80 cores, $627,000. Now, Oracle, like any other software company, is going to be fairly aggressive in terms of how they deal with new customers and bringing new licenses on. However, when it comes to maintenance and it comes to the support, Oracle and many other software companies as well are going to be fairly stringent on how they charge for maintenance, the way their revenue stream works. So when we talk about what their yearly maintenance cost is here, that $627,000, not un it's not unlikely that that's the bill that Oracle will present you at the end of the year. Uh, again, I'm going to be uh, I'm being very specific here on Oracle, but many other software companies do things the same way. Now I want to make a point here at the bottom. I say, remember, your mileage may vary. Objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. What I mean to say there is your situation may be a little bit different than this. But I wanted to use it as an example. Let's go to the next slide, Arlene, and show how it would work, same example, on an enterprise Linux server. That's this, uh, that's this idea of using an enterprise Linux server, we'll call it an ELS for short, to be able to do that consolidation. So let's use that same core count, 10 servers, 40 chips, 80 cores. That third bullet talks about a consolidation of 80 cores. And to be very conservative, we'll say it's going to be a 10 to 1 consolidation rate. So now instead of 80 cores, we're talking about 8 cores on Linux on System Z. The Oracle core factor, remember I talked about the distributed core factor as being 0.75. Well, on Linux on System Z, those IFLs, those Integrated Facilities for Linux, that's the processor that runs Linux on a System Z, ELS, that's just one. So we had 0.75 on the distributed servers, those V490s and one for the core factor on System Z. So now, the yearly maintenance paid for that System Z example is $83,600. Again, your mileage may vary, but Arlene, when you go to that next spreadsheet view on the next chart, I got it spelled out in a, a rather simple fashion, just exactly what I used those other charts for. Now here it is in the spreadsheet, where you can see the Enterprise Linux server, the distributed server, the notes, and how I got to the consolidation. Bottom line is your delta positive savings. That is the savings that you have or you can realize for Linux on System Z, $543,000 worth of savings. Not too bad just based on being able to consolidate Oracle licenses, software licenses from a multiple distributed environment to a Linux on System Z environment. Let's go to the next slide if you don't mind. Now Oracle and IBM, although they're competitors, we also work with one another very closely and on supporting uh, each other's environments and supporting the software. So the idea would be that Oracle and IBM work together in the support of System Z. And you can see here that we've expanded our porting resources to make Oracle technology infrastructure current and complete for Linux on System Z. What I mean by that is that when Oracle comes out with a patch on a quarterly basis, the patch levels come out at the same time on Linux on System Z as they do on x86. And you can see that we're investing in hardware resources for Oracle development. Oracle's investing in hardware resources as well to be able to align with the, with the versions as they continue to roll down. And you can see that, that Oracle and IBM have also published collateral in partnership to talk about how to run Linux on System Z. So 
we, we create, IBM creates and publishes red books and red papers on how to configure and consolidate Oracle, and Oracle does something similar in their environments here. Let's go to that next slide, okay, Arlene? Uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because it's really kind of small mouse type, but what I wanted to show is that Oracle and IBM continue to focus on currency and parity. So you can see the products that have been delivered in 2010. You can see the products that are delivered in 2011, and the development continues in 2012. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Arlene. I'm going to leave this here for a second and then be able to talk a little bit about specialty engines as they deal with Linux on System Z. And really when we talk about what we've done on the platform, I'll tell you that in the last few years, uh, from 2004 to the current year, 2012, Linux on System Z, Linux on the platform, has grown at a compound annual rate of 39% year over year from 2004. Now that's pretty important and that's pretty impressive because what we've done is we've used this idea of specialty engines. And if you think about the enterprise Linux server, we can do all sorts of different work on an enterprise Linux server. The one that's crucial here is going to be that integrated facility for Linux, or IFL for short. And what that allows us to do is run Linux only on a System Z server. And we can do that with any System Z server that's out there. So if I wanted to run Linux only on our latest and greatest server, uh, I certainly can do that. Uh, the folks here at Axiom do as well. And some of the advantages that you think about are we can, uh, it's, a lot, it's a lot more uh, green in terms of the environment. We talk about consolidation. We also talk about consolidation of footprint. And now that I have fewer legacy systems, fewer legacy distributed based servers, I can consolidate those from uh, a room full down to something that, you know, the size of your Sears Kenmore French door refrigerator. And that's about the size of our, uh, our mid-range system Z, that Z114 I talked about a little bit earlier. So, you know, the idea being we've really advanced what we can do on the platform, and Linux has been a big leader. Let's go to the next slide, Arlene, and talk about why customers use system Z for Oracle. Well, these are really a lot of the attributes around system Z and what system Z gives. From a high availability standpoint to Linux and open standards, the disaster recovery requirements. Lots of times customers have to duplicate their environment. You need one for one almost to be able to deliver disaster recovery. Well, we can do that at a lot more streamlined rate with Linux on System Z. In terms of customer data on System Z, uh, now I'll use I'll use the old term and I rarely use it, but I'll go ahead and use it here. Uh, from a mainframe standpoint. Our most key customers, whether it's financial services, whether it's insurance, whether it's public se sector or, or federal, a lot of key data sits on System Z. So customers have a lot of confidence in it, and from an Oracle standpoint, they want to have their data on the most, one of the most reliable or the most reliable platform that's out there. In terms of increased performance, uh, we'll tell you that you, know, you may not know this, but I'll, I'll give it to you. The latest System Z that we've introduced. Uh, in August. It's called the EC, that's Echo Charlie 12. The EC 12 has processors that run 5.5 gigahertz. That's the fastest processor that's out there for any microcomputer or any server. So people talk about System Z, well, you know, it's old, it's stodgy, it's slow. 5.5 gigahertz, not too shabby. And then in terms of the way we can utilize System Z, this server really is built for maximum utilization. Utilization up to 100% to be able to deliver to customers. So uh, it's not as if you look at your, you know, how much are we using our servers, and 5, 10, 15 percent, pretty average if you ask Gardner in terms of server utilization across the enterprise. Well, the reason those numbers are so low is that lots of times customers will be using those servers for a development environment where they're not used all the time, or a test environment where they're not used all the time. Well, System Z likes it when there's more workload piled on and you don't see a whole lot of degradation in terms of performance. And then from a security standpoint, System Z has always been the most secure environment out there in terms of uh, being able to deliver uh, a, a secure server. Uh, you'll see that Oracle indeed knows that, and that's why uh, another reason why customers like to use it from an Oracle standpoint. Let's go to the next slide, Arlene, and talk about a little bit about System Z and the enterprise flexibility. 
I've talked a little bit about the, uh, the last two generations of uh, System Z, and, and really we wanted to highlight what we've done from, you know, what we've done, and we call this, you know, our Z Enterprise introduction uh, two years back, where we actually combined the Z, System Z as, as we know it, I mean the, the, single, the single unit, with a Blade Center unit to be able to deliver flexibility to do, do database or system Z-based work on, on uh, again, I'll call it the mainframe. That's the second time I've used it, probably more, and, you know, more than I've used in the past year. And then couple that with a Blade server that runs different types of workloads that can interact. So those two are connected by a private network. Uh, the cool part about this is the workloads that run well on system Z can continue to run there. And the workloads that run well on power-based uh, power based blades or power-based architecture uh, can run there as well, and these two can share data. The reason I've got power, by the way, is that a lot of the Oracle, or some, or many of the Oracle applications that are out there uh, run on split-tier platforms. That is, one application can run on one tier, and the database can run on another tier. Uh, the Z Enterprise helps couple that together with a secure internal network. Let's go to the next slide. I want to talk a little bit about a few customers that are running Oracle on Linux on System Z. Uh, we've, uh, we've kept the names quiet to protect the innocent, but uh, I want to make sure that you know that we've got hundreds, and, and by hundreds, I say over a thousand customers now that run Oracle on the platform. Uh, they go everything from the small to the very large, and I'll uh, quickly run through these. The small system Z customer example for an oil and gas services provider, and this is somebody that actually used their small system Z to be able to deliver cloud-based services and cloud-based software as a service to their end user community. Uh, pretty cool solution that ran on a System Z Baker Charlie that was the uh, forerunner to the latest System Z 114. Now they run it on a 114. Uh, Medium-sized customer example uh, was the a scientific manufacturer. Uh, they're an equipment manufacturer and a retailer. Uh, ran a lot of their databases, uh, Oracle databases, mostly on Unix. Uh, but then brought those all over to System Z Linux uh, down to seven IFL, so seven processors that they were charged for on Linux on System Z. You can also see that, that this particular customer combined business intelligence and business analytics with uh, our Cognos-based solution to be able to do business analytics against the data that they were running. Let's go to the next slide, Arlene, and talk about a couple of larger examples where we've got a large government installation uh, with over 100 processors that run Oracle Rack. One thing that I didn't mention before, and I will now that it's up here on the screen, if you want to run Rack, real application cluster on Oracle, on System Z Linux, you certainly can do that. But some customers have found that based on what they need to do, whether it's high availability or whether it's clustering specifically, uh, they may be able to do away with Rack when they go to System Z Linux. And the cool part about that is Rack actually is a charge on top of your Oracle license. So you pay for the Oracle license, but you also pay for Oracle Rack. If you're able to eliminate Oracle Rack when you move to the platform, you can eliminate that license cost. Uh, and then finally, there's that large System Z customer example uh, where it had a, a relatively um, an aging, I guess, System Z of Z990. Uh, and then we brought it up to a Z10. Uh, that was a, a customer that had you know, all IFLs or many IFLs on this machine, all IFLs there. Uh, pretty neat. Uh, a pretty neat example of how customers moved from some of their old environments to some of their newer modern environments. Uh, some of them did only Linux on their service. Some of them did a combination of Linux and other workloads. So the idea here is I want to make sure that you're aware that we've got plenty of customers that have gone before you in being able to eliminate the Oracle license costs and then consolidate on Linux on System Z. Let's go to the next slide, Arlene. More support on Oracle and System Z Linux. I've, I've darkened out that first Oracle open world, but what I wanted to show you was the fact that Oracle participates with IBM in a number of different forums, whether it be open world, which has just passed us in October, uh, Share, which is essentially a System Z user-based group coming up in San Francisco in 2013, Oracle Collaborate and the SIG conference in Denver in April 2013. Uh, and what I found out uh, a little earlier today uh, is that this Oracle user group, the System Z uh, special interest group, uh, is the oldest and the most longstanding Oracle user group that's out there. Kind of cool when you think about 
back to the stuff we're on system Z. Let's go to the next slide. This slide should be on the top says distributed servers versus hybrid ELS solution. What I wanted to do is compare what a distributed server solution looked like, and this is an actual customer that Axiom is dealt with, and what that mapped to for the Z196. And just to give you, an, again, an idea of where we stand in the technology curve, uh, ZEC12, that's Echo Charlie 12, is our latest server. One generation back is the Z196, which is where you see the comparison here. And what I've done is divide this into hardware, software, facilities, and administration in terms of you can see what distributed servers look like. So there we had 136 x86 servers with 1,538 cores. Uh, that brought it down to from 1,538 cores down to 46 cores, 46 IFLs there on the right where you see Z196 Linux. So if you think about it and you work down through the rest of this chart and look at what we saved in software, facilities, floor space, and network, and network components, uh, you can see that the consolidation is quite evident. And also, you see it saves you know, a whole lot of money. So going back to our original slide on you know, what do we do for customers that are have aging servers, or what's, what are some solutions that we can provide uh, between ourselves and Axiom, we show that, A, we can consolidate, save money, and then, B, also show that we're able to save you know, the maintenance on how we take care of customers and how we take care of our own companies. Let's go to the last slide here, or the next slide uh, here, Arlene, where it says selecting an, architect, uh, an application, pardon me, where to start and next steps. When, when you leave the webcast, uh, for those of you that are here live and then those of you that are listening on replay, here's the way that I want you to take a look at how I would consider, how one would consider moving from a distributed environment uh, to the next step or to you know, an environment where, where Axiom can help you. Where you start to plan, and uh, I like the, uh, this is a, a colleague actually gave me this slide, and, and I really like it. If you don't know where you're going, uh, you won't know when you get there. So the good idea is to begin with the end in mind, look at a target, figure out what the sizing is, and then be able to make your plans from there. Uh, again, another hint down here in the second bullet, start with databases that are on lower utilized servers. You know, I talked a moment ago about the fact that a lot of the servers out there are lowly utilized servers. You see 7, 8, 6, 5% CPU utilization. Those might be the perfect ones to, to start with to be able to begin your transition over. And, and folks like uh, ourselves here at IBM and Axiom can help you make those kind of decisions. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, I'm going to stop with my part of the presentation, and I'm going to uh, turn it back over to uh, to Jeff Shoup and have him talk through some of the things that Axiom can deliver for you. Jeff. All right, great, Paul. Thank you so much. That was very good and very informative. And by the way, let me just toss this out. Um, a, I got a cold, so I hope you guys can understand me okay. And B, if you come up with any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box, like was mentioned earlier. And then uh, if we have time at the end, we'll get to them. We've already had a couple questions put in, so we want to make sure we have some time to get to them. So who is Axiom? As you can see from the slide, we've got three different um, areas that Axiom concentrates on. And but some of you may not be familiar with us, Axiom has a 40 plus year heritage in data and technology. So we are a very established and technology tenured organization. Um, we have data and consumer insights, partner and consumer connections, enterprise data management, data quality recognition and IP outsourcing and infrastructure outsourcing. Our infrastructure core competencies are the engine and the foundation that fuels the other complex parts of Axiom's business. For instance, as you can see above, the company maintains insight on over 500 million consumers, processes 25 trillion customer records annually, delivers 1.3 billion emails in 27 languages across 120 countries, and executes more than 350,000 multi-channel campaigns annually. Our ability to process and manage this amount of data of information requires tremendous infrastructure prowess, one that we're very happy to continue to utilize. Next slide. <coughs> All right, there we go. And uh, part of the infrastructure that is processing all that workload, as you can see above, between the grid and the windows, 25,000 servers, more than 35,000 MIPS and storage. So we've got quite a bit of technology that we're maintaining. 
across many footprints and many different data center locations. Next slide. And what we're going to talk about here shortly is specifically Linux on Z, but you can see from this slide that we've got services across the full IT spectrum of across our IT infrastructure. Next slide. The interesting thing is that from our perspective, mainframe is associated with legacy. And I think what you learned from what Paul said earlier, that while the term mainframe is legacy, mainframe really is talking about some bleeding edge technology that, that Linux on Z is able to take advantage of. And so now you can run your older tried and true COBOL Fortran applications across many different databases talking real time through memory with say Linux on Z on the same box. You can almost really get a data center in a box. And the neat thing is, is for those customers that like their old applications but still want to do things with them, maybe make them more modern or, or put a web front end on them, et cetera, then that's where the cool things that we've been talking about so far today can really come in to fruition. Now, <coughs> excuse me, the, <coughs> oh, boy. The legacy aspect of this, now we're not suggesting that all the legacy workload needs to go away, quite the contrary. There's a good place for it. There's a lot of good, good value from that. But when you take a look at some of the challenges facing today's um, companies with how they need to relate with their customers, be able to present the data, be able to interact with them, clearly that's where some of the value of Linux and Z or Linux in general, but we were talking about Linux and Z comes into play here. So from that standpoint, um, as the workload grows and spikes and you need that capacity, that's where the mainframe really shines. Next slide. So the legacy and platform for growth. So are you considering the cloud? Well, that's the buzzword. Many people are talking about it. Probably every company out there is talking about it. But when you're talking about the cloud, what are you really talking about? And what we talk about is take a look at what your needs are. Is it really just elastic demand? Is it just be able to get into some variable compute model? And so depending upon your definition of the cloud, one of the things that you can take a look at are the features of Linux on Z that can address some of those needs. Consider Linux on Z for large workloads. But you'll hear this, and Paul's heard it many times too, that's counter to my IT strategy. Well, maybe it's time to re-look at that strategy. We've got numerous customers say, hey, we've got to get off the mainframe. Well, yeah, but we like this, we like that, we like this. But the mainframe's too expensive. Well, is it really too expensive? or are just some of your legacy applications maybe too expensive. So really, bottom line, consider Linux on Z as your cloud platform. Next slide. Now we recognize that not everybody is going to have the ability to say, all right, fine, Linux on Z, suppose I want to try it. Well, then what? It's, I think probably it would be difficult for someone to, to say, all right, fine, I want to try it stand up all the infrastructure, not really know how to go to the next step. So that's where we have an offering that <coughs> we're allowing um, and, and encouraging people to take a test drive for Linux on Z. We have a lot of different Linux on Z offerings, shared, dedicated, pay by the drink, utility offering. But if you kind of are interested, but you don't really know, or maybe your application, well, yeah, but will it really run there, or yeah, but will I really get these benefits, et cetera. Come and take a look at, at Linux on Z, no strings attached, 60 days, come in and kick the tires, we'll stand up the environment, you can run your workload on there and test it. And then um, you would log on and put your application up and, and do your testing and do whatever you want with the environment to see if you think that that application running on Linux on Z would meet your business needs. 
if you need assistance doing that, we'll be happy to help you. And then, obviously, at the end of the day, what we're hoping is that not only do you like Linux NZ, but then maybe you would become a future customer of ours. So clearly, that's what we're hoping for. But if at the end of the day you try it and decide that you don't like it, or you try it and decide that you want to do it yourself, that's certainly your option as well. And you go back and, and that's it. So there's no strings attached. Next slide. Now, this is tying back into something that Paul mentioned earlier. Part of our expertise with Linux NZ, we, we ran a huge proof of concept from one of our customers. And I'm not going to go through all the details here, although we did uh, talk about this at the university, and we're going to be talking about this again at CA World coming up. So you're just going to have to go to CA World and listen to us. But we went through <laughs> a large proof of concept where not only did we just talk about things, we actually proved it. We built the duplicate database, we stood up the environment, ran a very exhaustive test, and saw firsthand the performance improvements and the performance gains. And this is probably, Paul, what, one of the largest PLCs, I think, probably in the, in the history of the world. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I consider it that. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we spent night and day there trying to work through this with this customer, and it was very exciting. So we have the expertise to help you get going on that. Uh, some of the things that they were looking at was it, it took them weeks to make changes, and they needed to turn that around in hours, et cetera. So you can read it on the screen. But this is the type of uh, prowess that Axiom has, along with our partners and IBM, to help you get there. We'd love to uh, talk with you about it. Next slide. So at this point in time, um, that's all we've got. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, Paul again, back on the phone. And I, I hope that in listening to the webinar and watching the slides go by that you know, you're excited as we are. We've got a proven workload here. We've got, from an IBM standpoint, a great partner in Axiom who's uh, tried and true. They've, they've, uh, they've been up and down the, the bench with us going through uh, a few proof of concepts, a few customers kicking the tires and being able to make things happen. So uh, we've, got a great, we've got a great team. Uh, we've, got a great, we've got great teamwork here between the two of us. Uh, before we go into too many questions here, and uh, you can either give your questions via chat or I'm going to turn over here to Arlene for a second to see if, uh, if there's anything else that we need to do. But I also want to introduce one of my colleagues that works with me side by side on a lot of these Oracle, uh, a lot of these Oracle engagements. His name is Galen Brazelton. Uh, when I talked about my role with IBM, that I'm the uh, new workload leader for Linux on System Z, uh, Galen is the new workload leader for Oracle for Linux on System Z. So when we go out and talk with customers about the ability to run their workload on System Z Linux uh, with Oracle, uh, Galen and I are attached by, at the hip uh, to a team on this stuff. Galen knows and works with a lot of our technical Oracle folks. Uh, Galen's also one of our key people that deals with Oracle in general. So uh, he's able to answer questions about you know, what they do uh, some of the support things that, that Oracle has given us, uh, and then he's been in the middle of a lot of that. So I've, I've got him on, although you don't see Galen's picture, he's uh, going to be here online to be able to answer questions that might be popping up from the webinar that we've got. And Arlene, what I'll do now is I'm going to turn it back over to you and uh, see if we can, A, either open up the lines for questions or, uh, or see if anything has come in uh, over the wire or over the chat here. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, as Paul had mentioned, uh, just send your questions through uh, the chat box on your control panel. And I'll kick it off here with the first question. How many customers run Oracle databases on Linux on System Z? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a great question. It's Paul. I'm gonna, uh, I know, what, Galen, you're out there. And since this one is right in your wheelhouse, I'm going to pass it over to you. Okay, thank you, Paul. That's a great question. One we get often, and the short answer to that is there's over a thousand customers doing Oracle on Linux on System Z worldwide. Um, and I say short answer because we really don't know the exact number of users. Neither Oracle nor IBM license the combination 
but uh, Oracle verified a couple of years ago that uh, through their support calls and capturing data at that time that there were over a thousand customers. We know that continues to grow. It's going quite rapidly. Um, so we conservatively say it's over a thousand. We have customers of all sizes. We have some of ours and Oracle's largest customers are doing this and really pushing the envelope with a solution. And we have smaller customers that have actually driven to the solution as a first time System Z or mainframe user came from an Intel environment like the TransApp example that was given. They were not meeting their service level requirements, so they moved over or looked at options, thought they were going to Unix solution, but saw the factor pricing with the all IFL system Z solution. So, gee, that's the place to do it. They've been very happy with it and um, minimized or eliminated their downtime from hardware outages for the couple, three years since. And um, we have a number of customers like that. So they cross industries, cross sizes, and it's a solution that continues to grow. Both IBM and Oracle continue to invest in it. Um, and my team, I've got a team of technical specialists that are very skilled in the solution and on the Oracle database solution itself. Um, are say very busy, very active because more and more customers seeing the benefits of this and moving to it that both uh, Paul and Jeff referred to. Many benefits of solution, not just the Oracle pricing, but the system Z virtualization and flexibility. One thing I must say in this too that um, we're, we're as IBM we're not promoting the Oracle database over our um, IBM database DB2, um, but we know a lot of users have a Oracle database and we see this as a very very attractive platform to run the Oracle database. Um, we assume that decision has been made and we don't get involved with the Oracle versus DB2 discussions, but we help with that right solution and that's where the investment is. Oracle and their investments has added to it with um, in the last few years um, with a dedicated team for development to it that has these skills and does the Z development only as well as in their level two support structure a dedicated system Z skill team that have decades of experience on the mainframe and system Z to uh, supplement the existing support structure of Oracle for Oracle support. So a lot of positives, a lot of growth, a growing number, but um, uh, it's uh, well over a thousand now that we have in this space, and a growing number with uh, lots of customers, lots of activity. We have resources that can help work alongside the Axiom resources to help you with your planning part. Join that if you want to uh, join that group of numbers that are benefiting from this solution. Thank you, Paul. Excellent. Arlene, uh, anything, uh, anything else out there question-wise? Yes. Uh, let me go on with questions here. Uh, how often do Linux on System Z customers get Oracle patches for their databases? Uh, that, that's another good one. So it, in, I, I may have answered it before, and now I'll go ahead and answer, and, and Galen can, Galen can uh, correct me if I'm, if I'm not in the right spot. Uh, the, the patches for Oracle come out quarterly, if I'm not mistaken, and from a System Z standpoint, you get the same patch set uh, for System Z as you do for the distributed environment. And that's, that's pretty cool because uh, that gives us the opportunity uh, for us to be able to, to be right there on par with patches that come out both on the x86 side or I'll say in, in general the distributed side and on Linux on System Z. Is that, uh, uh, am I speaking the truth out there, Galen? Yeah, Paul, that's exactly correct. Uh, this was a commitment made by that uh, dedicated um, support team that I mentioned. Uh, Raymond Wayne is the manager of it, and he committed back in early 2009 that we'll deliver uh, Linux Z patches at the same time and with the quarterly patches release that we have. Oracle has pre-announced a year in advance what day that patch set update PSU will come out, and it's been you know, for all platforms, and Z is included with that. Prior to that, in the startup of it, there were some delays, and sometimes we didn't have that solution there. As, as mentioned, this is the, the growing space of System Z, with Linux on System Z, and this, the solution, the history of Oracle and System Z actually goes back over 25 years with the Oracle solution on ZOS. But um, in the last decade, IBM has invested heavily and seen a lot of growth and really new life to the mainframe through Linux on System Z. 
and Oracle saw that and said, gee, that makes a lot of sense for us and it best fits for us because we develop on, we Oracle develop on Linux. And this is just another Linux, same kernel with a Red Hat R system um, on Z that's on any other platform, so it's just another Linux R system. It makes a lot more sense. And Oracle made that transition. During that transition period, certainly there were some startups and some delays and a small number of users, but um, in the 2009 time frame is when this commitment came from Oracle and those patch set updates that were mentioned and then that every time since and Linux on system Z patch set updates are at the same time as for Z as for other platforms. Also important with that, included with that patch set updates are critical patch updates from at the same time and the same kind of delivery and Z is included with that. So we feel very current because we don't have support issues in this. We have a great teamwork with that support team within Oracle that's specific to the Linux that work only with us and our customers to resolve the issues problems that come up. But really there's very few problems that come up in the space as far as Oracle code and running on it since we know that it's Linux is Linux and Oracle is Oracle. It's the same Oracle code that runs on any other solution with the minor differences for drivers and things like that. But um, the Oracle support team has said there's two specific cases they can recall or come up with over the last five years that have been specific code problems within Oracle for Linux on System Z, unique to System Z, everything else is just generic that they deal with and nothing separate and different. So it's been a very, very good solution. It's one of the best fit solutions. It's really the Oracle has been the key driver of our Linux space and IFLs for this whole post of Linux with the over a thousand customers I mentioned that are doing this. So good question, and um, and um, oh, I extended my answer with more information than we asked, but I want to share that with you about the solution and the excitement around it because this really is a great solution. And it's really a, a, such a good fit with Oracle on Linux on Z with the data serving capabilities of System Z and Linux on System Z. Oracle database is a very good fit for Linux. So it makes a very good match. You know, it's just a database move, actually, moving your database to Linux on System Z. And then the license picture that we're going to was talked about uh, by contract and their standard contract in Oracle. The licenses are transferable, so whatever license you purchase by the platform forms can be moved to the system Z, this 1.0 core factor that Paul talked about. So it's very attractive and a lot of customers are getting a lot of benefits from it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I'd just like to say a few words about the Outsourcing Institute. Um, uh, we're a professional organization dedicated to providing independent best practice tools roadshow events, networking opportunities to all forms of outsourcing. Located at outsourcing.com, we have 70,000 members globally. OI specializes in providing low-cost and no-cost alternatives for outsourcing buyers in need of RFP tools, vendor selection assistance, training, as well as general support and coaching. For those of you who market into the space, we offer an array of very targeted sponsorship and promotional opportunities. We have a sister company called CMS who provides recruiting services for those seeking to hire outsourced professionals experienced at buying, selling, managing, or consulting in this arena. Our contact information is at the bottom of the screen for those of you who have questions. Now I'd like to say a few words about um, some upcoming events we have. Uh, the first one is the Outsourcing Institute Roadshow, which is next week on December 5th. Uh, this show is focusing on outsourcing governance and relationship management is, and is being held in New York City. The following day, we have another event called the Sales Readiness 2013 Summit, what outsourcing service providers need to succeed in the new year. And uh, that's the held in New York City on December 6th, and we have some other dates and locations there next year for the summit. And also, uh, in the spring, we have the Wall Street Tech Conference, and that will be covering um, what's known as T5, sourcing, cloud computing, big data, mobility, security, and compliance. To find out more details or to register for these events, you could go to outsourcing.com slash events. 
Now, on behalf of uh, Axiom and IBM and the Outsourcing Institute, I would like to thank you for joining us today. Thank you and have a great day.